Hi everybody, it's Carrie Fridley and Sugarfoot. And today we're going to be talking about the swing era, part two. Coleman Hawkins, the father of the saxophone. While the swing era was the time of the big band, it also featured numerous musicians who forged a name for themselves as soloists. Indeed, the late 1930s and early 1940s saw the rise of many musical celebrities, musicians who broke new ground and introduced new styles of playing and singing, which continue to influence jazz to this day. Coleman Hawkins represented one such voice in jazz. Today, the saxophone is an instrument closely linked with jazz. It is easy to forget that until the 1930s, the saxophone was something of a musical anomaly. A member of the woodwind family which saw less performance than its more popular cousin, the clarinet. Jazz writer and historian Leroy Jones noted that Bean, a popular nickname for Hawkins, was the first musician to make the sax a respectable instrument, as far as jazz musicians were concerned. While Hawkins was not the first major jazz musician to make a name for himself as a saxophonist, we have seen how Sidney Bechet and Frank Trumbauer established themselves as respected soloists on the instrument. He was truly the first international celebrity on the instrument and the first player to tirelessly promote the instrument as a powerful expressive tool in jazz. A virtuoso of the saxophone, Hawkins created a new approach for the instrument that is still widely emulated today. Hawkins was born in Missouri in 1904, the birthplace of ragtime. Like Scott Joplin, the king of ragtime, Hawkins was a diligent student of both contemporary popular American styles and the Western European classical tradition. By the age of 17, he had already demonstrated precocious skill on the saxophone, piano, and cello, and was enrolled in classes in harmony, counterpoint, and composition at Washburn College, all while finishing high school. A career in academia may have awaited this bright young musician had it not been for an opportunity to perform with the legendary classic blues singer Mammy Smith in 1921. He continued his rise to fame performing with the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra where he began focusing more on the powerful sound of the tenor saxophone as early as 1923. The instrument, which had been largely relegated to the category of an auxiliary instrument used for special effects, received Hawkins' dedicated attention. He developed an unprecedented level of virtuosity and tone production, which inspired generations of jazz saxophonists. Every tenor saxophonist since the 1920s owes their lineage to Hawkins validating his title as the father of the tenor sax and Fletcher Henderson's description of him as the world's greatest tenor saxophonists. Hawkins' innovative approach to the tenor saxophone made him an international celebrity. In light of Louis Armstrong's recent success in Europe, Hawkins decided to pursue a similar path. The now confident saxophonist contacted the British band leader and booking agent, Jack Hilton, 
and began a six-year engagement touring the entire European continent. During his time in Europe, Hawkins received a level of praise and adulation that few musicians, especially African-American musicians, experienced during the bleak years of the Great Depression in the United States. When he first performed in Copenhagen, he was greeted by 5,000 fans that carried him on a throne to his taxi. But Hawkins was more than just the European superstar for America's music. He was also a writer and pedagogue, contributing three articles to the English music periodical Melody Maker, discussing everything from his sound concept and practice routine to his choice of reeds and mouthpieces he used when playing. Hawkins ultimately returned to the United States and continued to build upon his star success. On October 11, 1939, the saxophonist permanently stamped his name into the catalog of jazz giants with his seminal recording of the American standard, Body and Soul. The highlight of this recording is a 64 measure solo which illuminates Hawkins's mastery as an improviser. It is one of the most widely emulated solos by jazz saxophonists, with its logical progression of musical variations on the first few notes of the tune's melody. Hawkins transforms the otherwise simple melody into a virtuosic display of his saxophone playing. Listen to Body and Soul, performed by Coleman Hawkins. There's a listening link in your textbook. With an already impressive career, the 38-year-old saxophonist could have stopped here, relishing his success and in going into an early retirement. But in the true spirit of any dedicated artist, Hawkins could not cease to explore what was musically possible as the 1940s approached. In 1948, he released the innovative Picasso, the first record to con consist entirely of an unaccompanied solo saxophone performance. Hawkins' ability to weave a structured and captivating musical performance without the aid of a rhythm section is testimony to the saxophonist's abilities as an improviser. There's a listening link for Picasso by Coleman Hawkins in your textbook. Hawkins continued his musical endeavors through the 1960s, performing and recording with many younger musicians who had grown up listening to and emulating the saxophone giant. The legacy Hawkins left cannot be understated. Hawk proved to later jazz musicians that the instrumentalist, as a probing, searching artist, could see the same level of financial success and popularity as entertainers and vocalists. His dedication, passion, and commitment to excellence established him as one of the great musicians in jazz history. Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday, leading ladies of jazz. On the left is Ella Fitzgerald, and on the right, Billie Holiday. The liberation of the instrumentalist as a, as a celebrity in jazz was coupled with another major shift in the swing era. The woman as a jazz superstar began to appear as well. This is not to say that there had not been successful women in jazz prior to the swing era. Indeed, we have seen how the classic blues singers became hit sensations in the early 1920s and Lil Hardin established a name for herself in her collaborations with Louis Armstrong later that decade. 
Nonetheless, there was an absence of a powerful female voice in the jazz world until the swing era when two singers, Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday, became nationally acclaimed divas of jazz. Ella Fitzgerald set a new standard for vocal performance in jazz, demonstrating unprecedented virtuosity with her improvisational abilities. Ella's graceful and vibrant vocal style, coupled with an enormous voice range of over three octaves, was only part of why she was and still is considered by many to be the first lady of song. Like Louis Armstrong and Benny Goodman, two musicians with whom Ella performed and recorded, Fitzgerald's biography is a true rags-to-riches story. Growing up in a fractured household, estranged from her father from a young age, Ella dreamed of a career as a dancer. Upon entering a talent contest at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, Ella, who was an exceptionally shy child, made a last-minute decision to sing instead. This spur-of-the-moment decision would forever change Ella's life, but did not result in immediate success. Ella traveled from one talent show to the next, homeless and barely surviving in a state of poverty. Ella's break came when Chick Webb, one of the greatest drummers in Harlem, hired Ella as a vocalist in his renowned big band. During the late 30s, Ella established herself as a vocal talent par excellence, recording with several significant swing air artists, including Benny Goodman. The following recording of Good Night My Love listed in your textbook showcases Ella's eloquent diction, supple voice, and optimistic character. Be sure to listen to Good Night My Love. Ella gained even greater commercial success with her recording of a Tisket, A Tasket with the Chick Webb Orchestra in 1938. The record was Fitzgerald's first number one hit on the American billboards. Be sure to listen to A Tisket, A Tasket by Ella Fitzgerald. There's a link in your textbook. For the remainder of the swing era, Ella would not see the same level of commercial success. Following Webb's passing in 1939, Fitzgerald took over the late drummer's ensemble, directing the group for five years before embarking on a solo career. A failed marriage and a diminished interest in the young singer's talent might have ended Fitzgerald's musical career prematurely. Fortunately for Ella and the jazz world, Norman Grants recognized the singer's enormous potential to become the queen of jazz. Grants was to Fitzgerald what John Hammond was to Benny Goodman. He was more than an agent. He was an avid supporter of Ella encouraging her to record and collaborate with some of the biggest names in jazz throughout the late 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, including Louis Armstrong. Like Hammond, Grants also wished to rectify the rampant attitude of racial intolerance in the American music industry. At a time when African-American musicians were treated as second-class citizens, Grants insisted on their equal treatment, going so far as to remove the segregating 
white toilets and Negro toilets signs at performance venues in order to integrate the audience and canceling concerts where the African-American musicians did not receive proper remuneration. Following the swing era, Ella put out numerous recordings showcasing her versatility and command as a vocal improviser. Like Hawkins, she gained recognition as an international performer, receiving better treatment abroad as an African-American performer than she often did in the United States. Her 1960 album, Live in Berlin, showcases Fitzgerald at the height of her abilities, as it captures a live performance from February of that year with a jazz combo. Continuing the tradition of scat singing, popularized by her idol Louis Armstrong, Fitzgerald demonstrates her musical prowess as she improvises over the standard, How High the Moon, adding subtle embellishments and new lyrics to the original melody. More significantly, she improvises with the dexterity and technique of an instrumentalist, transcending her role as a vocalist. In fact, she quotes the melody to Ornithology, a composition by the seminal saxophonist Charlie Parker, who we will study in Module 7, revealing her knowledge of the instrumental jazz tradition in a breathtaking solo, which lasts for over five and a half minutes. Be sure to listen to How High the Moon. The link is listed in your textbook. Billie Holiday has an iconic voice that is easily recognizable. And when you listen to her, I would not be surprised if you recognize her voice right away just from having heard it elsewhere. She truly is a sensitive artist and has musical interpretations of melodies that are rooted in the blues and she really knows how to hang back and be behind the beat. It's very hard to replicate. Now Billie Holiday had a limited vocal range of only an octave and a half and could not compete with Ella Fitzgerald's enormous range of over three octaves. An octave is spans eight notes. Additionally, Holiday lacked the technical virtuosity and pure tone of Ella's immaculate voice. However, Billy embraced herself as a performer and became one of the greatest vocal interpreters of jazz music only matched in her influence and innovation by her predecessor, Louis Armstrong. As an emotional conduit for musical ideas, Holiday established herself as one of the master interpreters of jazz music. Here we see a picture of Billie Holiday with her trademark gardenia flower in her hair from early in her career. She's also known by her nickname, Lady Day. Billie Holiday's life story is a tragic one, laced with sadness and pain that often came across in the singer's performances and recordings. Born into a broken household, Billy's parents both separated while she was very young, initiating a series of traumatic events. Holiday was raped. Her mother worked in a brothel, and then she brought Billy into work at the brothel, too. 
She also spent a year in the house of the Good Shepherd on the grounds that she was a minor without proper care and guardianship. These harsh realities informed the melancholic vocal style for which Billy would become known for. Her instantly recognizable weeping sound, reminiscent of the cathartic moaning of the classic blues singers, instantly distinguished her from the more jubilant approach of many of her contemporaries. It only seems fitting that Lady Day would see her first commercial hit with I Cried For You in 1936. There's a link for I Cried For You in your textbook, so be sure to listen to Billie Holiday's first hit. This is a picture of the label on a 78 record which is the format that I Cried For You was released on. And a 78 record means the record will spin at the speed of 78 revolutions per minute. And on these 78 records, they were about a foot in diameter you would have one song on one side and then you'd take the record and flip it over and have another song on the other side. So you have the A side and the B side. Later they came out with records that would have six or seven songs on each side and then you flip it over and uh, they went at a slower speed 33 RPMs. Now, Billie Holiday collaborated with some of the most popular musicians of the day, including Benny Goodman, Teddy Wilson, who can be heard playing piano on I Cried For You, and Duke Ellington. However, it was her collaboration with Lester Young, remember him from Module 5, that produced some of Holiday's most memorable recordings. Young forged an instant musical connection and deep friendship with Holiday. Both shared a passion for the blues, for heart-wrenching ballads, and both had a troubled past. Lester Young, like Billy, came from an abusive household, abandoning his family and experiencing hardship as a traveling musician for much of his early life. One can hear the musical symbiosis of Holiday and Young on the recording of the popular jazz standard, All of Me a tune often interpreted in a more upbeat fashion. Holiday and Young set the new standard, pun intended, for this 1931 composition, recording an emul often emulated version almost a decade later in 1941. One only has to listen to Young's moaning saxophone and Holiday's treatment of the lyrics as a lament to understand why. Listen to All of Me. You can find the link in your textbook. Holiday and Young's suffering extended beyond personal tribulations reflecting a wider social issue, the issue of segregation and racial injustice in America during the swing era. Young narrowly escaped being lynched as a child, and Holiday experienced her fair share of racism as well. In a famous 1939 interview from Downbeat magazine, 
Lady Day explains the unfair treatment she experienced working in the popular clarinetist's band, Artie Shaw, describing how she was required to enter the venue through the back door and take the back elevators to get to the stage. An independently minded and strong willed woman who was not afraid to let her opinion be known, Holiday bravely recorded Strange Fruit as a reaction to the pervasive nature of racism towards African Americans in the United States. The somber work tells the story of a lynching and established Billy as more than a great jazz singer, but a political activist who used jazz as a medium for social change. You can listen to Strange Fruit by clicking on the link in your textbook. By the end of the swing era, Billy's already troubled life took a turn for the worse when she was arrested for heroin possession. A longtime addict, this was one of Holiday's many vices alongside alcohol. The esteemed Lady Day was forced to spend 10 months in a federal woman's reformatory, which was essentially a prison. Now a convicted felon, Holiday's cabaret card was revoked, and the once in-demand singer struggled to find performance opportunities between 1948 and 1951. The cabaret card was needed. Each musician had a cabaret card they had to be officially approved in order to perform in New York City. So if you lost your cabaret court card, you couldn't work. Like Ella Fitzgerald, however, Lady Day saw her career revitalized by Norman Grant's by this time in her career, continued drug use, alcohol abuse, and age had caught up to Holiday's voice. Her already limited singing technique was now restricted even further, though many musicians found a raw and honest quality to Billy's new sound. Alto saxophonist Jackie McLean suggested that the absence of a finely tuned vocal instrument left emotion as her only tool of expression. The following 1957 recording of the blues number Fine and Mellow, listed in your textbook, showcases Billy in a more vulnerable and powerful role as a symbol of survival in a racist nation and a difficult music industry. This live video recording also provides an opportunity to directly compare the musical style of Coleman Hawkins, who has a solo starting at 50 seconds in, with that of Lester Young. His solo comes in at 127. One can see Holiday's admiration of Young in this video whom she nicknamed Prez, short for President. Fine and Mellow is a snippet from a live TV broadcast on NBC TV where they did live jazz performances with some of the most popular musicians of the time and that's why both saxophonists were, were there at the same time and sharing uh, the solos on Billy Holiday's number. By the late 1950s Holiday's career was back in full swing. However the jazz legend would soon suffer the consequences of a hard and fast life, 
succumbing to a kidney infection on July 17th of 1959. Jazz historian Ted Goya describes one particularly tragic element of her passing representative of the hardships Holiday had to endure throughout her life. It is also symbolic of the isolation, oppression, and difficulty jazz musicians and African Americans persisted in a country that, even at the time of Holiday's life, was still divided by racial issues. At the time of her death, Holiday's bank account showed a balance of only 70 cents, but hospital workers who came to take the body found $750 taped to one of her legs. An instinctive gesture of self-preservation by one who, so often betrayed by those closest to her, had come to trust only in herself. Duke Ellington in the Swing Era Any discussion of the music of the Swing Era would be incomplete without a study of Duke Ellington during this period. It was none other than Duke, whose 1932 classic, It Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing, foreshadowed the success of Benny Goodman at the Palomar three years later. One can hear the up-tempo, hot style of this sound in the listening link to the original recording, which is listed in your textbook, it features several members of the Ellington Band, including vocalist Ivy Anderson and trombonist Joe Nanton, whom we discussed in Module 4. However, it is alto saxophonist Johnny Hodges who stands out as the star on this recording. With his technical virtuosity and smooth, refined tone, Hodges, like Coleman and Young, had a significant impact on many generations of saxophonists. The king of swing himself, Benny Goodman, adulated Hodges, going so far as to say in a 1939 interview, that Hodges was by far the greatest man on alto sax that I have ever heard. Be sure to listen to Johnny Hodges on It Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing. But this 32 bar AABA tune, very much in the style of his older works, the A section in a minor key and the B section in a major key, only displays one side of Ellington's multifaceted and prolific artistic output during the swing era. Duke had always recognized his role as an artist, sharing this identity with his occupation as an entertainer. But a tour to Europe in 1933 with his big band sparked a renewed interest in exploring jazz as a serious artistic medium. Following his European tour, Duke began to compose works that were longer and intended for performance in a concert hall setting. Ellington's 1941 multi-movement concert suite, Black, Brown, and Beige, represents what many consider to be his greatest large-scale work. As early as 1933, Ellington began to compile a body of literature describing the African-American experience. This newfound sense of cultural pride and identity is reflected in black, brown, and beige, which Ellington intended as a musical representation of black history in America. In a 1956 interview, Ellington described the impetus for writing such an ambitious musical work, stating that the music has to do with the state of mind, not the color of the skin, emphasizing the cultural heritage 
of black music in America. The cathartic power of the blues, work songs, and spirituals sung by an oppressed and enslaved culture come to life in Come Sunday, a movement from black, brown, and beige, which is often performed outside of the suite as an individual work. Come Sunday, which begins at 436 in the link in your textbook, features the multi-instrumentalist Ray Nance on violin, performing a lyrical introduction to the movement before Johnny Hodges offers a heartfelt rendition of the melody at 7.03. So be sure to listen to part of Black, Brown, and Beige by clicking on the Come Sunday link in your book. Now, Mahalia Jackson in this picture is known as the first rock and roll guitarist. She played electric guitar, and you might want to listen to some of her work as well. While Duke was working on these larger scale musical works, he also continued to put out a number of popular songs during this period. Some of his most popular works, including Mood Indigo, Solitude, Prelude to a Kiss, and In a Sentimental Mood, were popular dance numbers in the swing era and have since become jazz standards. It was during the swing era that Duke also initiated one of the most important musical collaborations of his career with the young composer and lyricist Billy Strayhorn. Here you can see Duke and Billy Strayhorn. Strayhorn was well versed and studied in the classical tradition and had already composed a waltz, a concerto for piano and percussion, incidental music for a stage show, and several shorter tunes before his 21st birthday. Duke immediately recognized the precocious musician's potential as a composer and arranger in the Ellington's Big Band when he first met Strayhorn in 1938. The young pianist astounded Duke by performing Ellington's band leader's composition, Sophisticated Lady, exactly as the veteran band leader had just played it. This fortuitous meeting began what would become an almost 30-year musical partnership, with Strayhorn composing a wealth of music for the Ellington Big Band, including the ensemble's signature hit, Take the A Train. Listen to Take the A Train from the Duke Ellington Orchestra. There is a link provided in your textbook. The expansive ballad Lush Life is representative of Strayhorn's classical training and also alludes to the alienation the composer felt as both an African-American and an openly gay jazz musician. The latter is especially significant in the context of the time in which Lush Life was composed, as people in the LGBTQ community often experience the same violence, everything from being referred to as deviants to being lynched as, Africans Ameri as African Americans. The introspective and erudite lyrics are mirrored in the unpredictable yet beautiful harmonic changes which occur throughout this miniature tone poem. There is a listening link for Lush Life by Billy Strayhorn with him singing and playing the piano in your book. There is also an arrangement of one of the most popular versions of Strayhorn's masterpiece that was recorded by vocalist Johnny Hartman and saxophonist John Coltrane almost three decades later. So that link is also listed in your textbook 
for you to compare. Ellington met another brilliant young musician in 1939, the virtuosic bassist Jimmy Blanton. In a similar fashion to Benny Goodman, Duke wanted to pursue smaller chamber music and jazz combo projects while he was writing larger scale works for his full big band. Blanton represented a turning point in the history of jazz bass playing. He was more than a member of the rhythm section, but a soloist and improviser of notable caliber. One can hear Blanton's highly developed technique and melodic prowess on the 1940 duet, Pitter Panther Patter, establishing him as the first true virtuoso of the bass in jazz. Tragically, Blanton would die of tuberculosis only a year later in 1941, but his body of work with Ellington would influence generations of jazz bassists. There's a listening link for Pitter Panther Patter by the Duke Ellington, with Duke Ellington and Jimmy Blanton. It's not the whole big band but you can watch it on YouTube, so be sure to check that out. Gypsy Jazz or Hot Club Jazz. Here you can see the typical configuration of the ensemble, three guitars, violin, and bass. Stefan Grappelli is playing the violin on the far left, and Django Reinhardt, is playing guitar front and center. Perhaps one of the most significant occurrences for jazz music during the swing era was the birth of gypsy jazz or hot club jazz. A unique style combining European folk styles and American jazz, this French music possessed a, a distinct and new sound that excited audiences. From a global perspective, the music represented something unprecedented in jazz, the development of a jazz style outside of the United States. It is important to recognize that prior to the development of this new hot club jazz, all subgenres of jazz originated in America. The development of the new music represented the global impact of jazz all the more astounding when one considers that by the swing era, the genre was only four decades old. Yet jazz had made an impact across the Atlantic by the end of the Second World War. As early as 1914, James Reese Europe took his all African American ensemble overseas to perform early jazz as well as ragtime music and the foxtrot. The pioneering band leader worked closely with dancers Irene and Vernon Castle, who popularized the accompanying choreography to this lively music. Thanks to Reese and the Castle team, the foxtrot would become an established part of modern ballroom dancing. Europe extensively toured France during the First World War, serving his country as band leader Lieutenant Rees with the popular ensemble the 369th Infantry, more commonly known as the Hellfighters. The Hellfighters entertained European audiences and Americans stationed abroad until Reese's death in 1919. The original Dixieland Jazz Band, whom we studied in Module 4, also toured the continent, bringing their concept of New Orleans jazz to European audiences. There's a listening link of James Reese Europe and the Hellfighters performing Memphis Blues in your textbook. Natives of the Old World adored jazz, 
but for the most part, largely mimicked the American genre. Guitarist Django Reinhardt broke this tradition. The Belgian-born Reinhardt was, in many ways, a European counterpart to many of America's most significant jazz musicians. Like Louis Armstrong, Reinhardt experienced a childhood of poverty. While Armstrong spent it selling coal in the slums of New Orleans, Reinhardt was born into a bare essentials setting in the survivalist trappings of his traveling Romani gypsy family. Like Duke Ellington, Reinhardt's musical training included a study of the classical European literature. Django was well-versed in a variety of orchestral and solo music literature through his classical violin training, including music by Chopin and Strauss. And like many American jazz musicians, Reinhardt would experience a series of hardships throughout his life. Reinhardt's life began in suffering as the musician was born in a traveling caravan in the cold winter of 1910. This would continue throughout Reinhardt's childhood. When Django was five years of age, his father abandoned the family, forcing the young man to steal chickens and beg for money while his mother performed music to help support Django and his two siblings. Fortunately for Django, his constant exposure to music through his mother would foster his ultimate career. The young Django took up multiple instruments, studying violin and banjo before settling on guitar, and was exposed to a variety of musical styles, including the classical canon, Romani folk songs, French folk melodies, and Spanish flamenco guitar literature. Django's greatest musical transformation, however, occurred as the result of a physical tragedy. In 1928, Reinhardt was burned in a caravan fire, leaving the musician with only two working fingers on his left hand as a result of his injuries. Undeterred, the guitarist spent his 18 bedridden months developing a new technique of melodic improvisation, where only the index and middle finger were utilized. Jazz has a long history of music where expression through art triumphs over the injustices of life. The blues, for example, represented a means of catharsis for socially oppressed African Americans in the 20th century. Reinhardt embodied this tradition of hope through music in overcoming his physical deformation to create an innovative concept of jazz. Reinhardt's newly adapted approach, however, was not exclusively manifested in his unique approach to the guitar. Django reinforced his sound concept in the atypical instrumentation of his jazz ensemble, Quintet du Hot Club de France. One highly uncharacteristic aspect of the group was the total absence of woodwind, brass, and percussion instruments. This is a notable change when one considers how these three instrumental groups provided the foundation for many jazz groups prior, and in New Orleans jazz were the only families of instruments present. The quintet's nonconformist setup of three Selmer guitars, which are special guitars employed by Django and his ensemble for, for cutting volume and a tinny presence, upright bass, and violin made perfect sense for a gypsy ensemble where the portability of the instruments was paramount. 
Django also fused various musical elements into a cultural melting pot of sound. One of Reinhardt's most popular tunes, Minor Swing, represents this amalgamation of American jazz with European music. The melody, a simple repeating arpeggio figure built around a basic chord progression based on the blues, evokes the riff-based melodies of the Kansas City sound with an emphasis on syncopation and groove over a sophisticated melodic contour. One can also hear the propelling four to the floor rhythm in this track. The two rhythm guitars in the quintet amplified this groove through short strumming patterns which came to be known as la pompe, the pump. Coupled with two-step feel in the bass, the two rhythm guitars provided a steadily driving pulse for Reinhardt and violinist Stefan Grappelli to solo over. The recording is Minor Swing by the Quintet du Hot Club de France. Be sure to listen to this through the link in your textbook. However, Reinhardt drew on the diversity of his influences, incorporating French classical music into his playing. His recording of Nuage, which literally means clouds in French, represents the guitarist's love of impressionistic music, a genre represented by dreamlike soundscapes and influenced by the impressionist painters of the late 19th century. What is amazing is that Claude Debussy, one of the most famous of the Impressionist composers, was also a huge fan of African-American music, writing a solo piano work, Gollywog's Cakewalk, in the style of French Impressionistic piano and American ragtime. In both Debussy's and Reinhardt's composition, take notice of the lush and expansive harmonies, which are designed, especially in nuage, to represent the dream state and evoke floating imagery of clouds. Both musical works, written almost three decades apart, share a commonality in their fusion of jazz rhythm and French harmony into a seamless musical marriage. So the first link to listen to is Nuage by Django Reinhardt. And the second one listed in your textbook is Gollywog's Cakewalk by Debussy. Tragically, Reinhardt died in 1953. The guitarist and composer left a huge mark on the jazz world receiving praise from his musical idol, Duke Ellington, as among the few great inimitables of our music. Grappelli, who would outlive Django by almost half a century, carried on the hot club jazz legacy while also elevating the violin to the role of a solo instrument in jazz music. There is a recording that demonstrates Grappelli's gripping and emotionally charged prowess as an improviser, and it's Grappelli's rendition of Stardust that you can find in your textbook. Jazz as Popular Music, Glenn Miller's Patriotic Sounds. It is important to remember that while the swing era was a time of great artistic innovations in jazz, it also saw the homogenization and commercialization of this music. While jazz had a long history as a vehicle for musical expression and improvisation, it also shared a symbiotic relationship with dance. We saw in the last module how the Lindy Hop and the Jitterbug both gained popularity with American audiences. We have also seen in this module how the Foxtrot took both America and Europe by storm 
as a result of its association with musical performance. In the swing era, the connection between dance and music reached an all-time high, one that would not be seen again in the history of jazz. Many big bands shifted away from an emphasis on musical innovation and improvisation, focusing instead on catchy, danceable melodies designed purposely for American audiences who needed a pleasurable escape from the difficulties of the Depression and the Second World War. America needed a simpler, happier music as the greatest generation went through an, through a childhood of economic hardship, only to get to the promising early years of their adulthood fighting in an international war. The United States experienced enormous casualties in World War II, and individuals living on the home front gave up many luxuries in order to contribute to the larger war effort. Many musicians were enlisted in military bands, and jazz bands traveled abroad as a means of entertainment for GIs stationed in Europe, Africa, and Asia. Jazz music was not just a musical genre now, but an emblem of American pride. No band leader embodied this patriotic spirit better than Glenn Miller. Miller's band provided a stark contrast to the other big bands described in modules five and six. While the Ellington big band was innovative and daring, attempting to break new ground, Miller's ensemble played it safe, playing simple, catchy melodies, while Goodman's big band was interested in an exciting, energetic, and hot style. The Glenn Miller big band harkened back to the sweet and refined sounds of dance bands like the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. In fact, Miller openly admitted to wanting a polished sounding dance band over a hotter sounding ensemble. In a 1940 downbeat interview, Miller clearly stated, I haven't a great jazz band and I don't want one. I want a kick to my band, but I don't want the rhythm to hog the spotlight. And perhaps most significantly, Miller had little interest in focusing on improvisation. This cornerstone element of jazz, and a major part of the Kansas City approach, Goodman's sound, and the Ellington's big band, was noticeably absent in many of Miller's tight arrangements, which left little room for creative expression. This is not to say that improvisation was wholly absent in Miller's arrangements, however opportunities to print to improvise were slim. The, the example in your book, American Patrol, is in fact an 1885 composition which Miller only slightly updated with stock rhythms and riffs idiomatic to the swing era. The only improvisation which occurs in the course of the entire recording is a brief 11 second trumpet solo which comes in at 224, lasting for only eight measures of music. So listen to American Patrol by clicking the link in your textbook. The predictable elements of Miller's music contributed largely to his success, with chart-topping hits like Pennsylvania 6-5000, -5 Tuxedo Junction, and perhaps his most famous number, In the Mood, Glenn Miller became a sort of poster child during the swing era, a white band leader with an accessible sound and presentation that was an American style as American as apple pie. Miller was embraced by listeners of all demographics. Miller gained even more popularity when he acted in accordance with the national wartime effort, joining the U.S. Army Air Corps 
In December 1944, Miller's plane mysteriously disappeared as he was flying over the English Channel. No physical remains of the plane or Miller were ever found, generating a myriad of conspiracy theories. What was certain, however, was that Miller's last flight also represented the swan song for the swing era. In the years following the Second World War, new styles and genres like rock and roll, country, music, and R&B would come to overshadow the popularity of jazz. This shift in public taste, however, did not mean the end of jazz. In fact, it had the opposite effect, providing a catalyst for the dawn of modern jazz, where exciting new directions in the music began to evolve in ways unprecedented. Glossary Alto saxophone Smaller member of the saxophone family Played by Johnny Hodges Foxtrot Ballroom dance popularized by Irene and Vernon Castle in the 1910s Greatest Generation Generation born during the Great Depression and growing up through the swing era. Groove, term utilized by musicians to refer to a rhythmic feeling. Gypsy jazz or hot club jazz, subgenre of jazz fusing Eastern European music, Impressionistic French music, and jazz. Hellfighters popular U.S. military band which spread jazz to Europe during World War I. Impressionistic, genre represented by dreamlike soundscapes and influenced by the Impressionist painters of the late 19th century. La Pompe, characteristic rhythm played by the guitar in Gypsy Jazz. Quintet du Hot Club de France, famous gypsy jazz ensemble led by Django Reinhardt. Selmer guitar, a unique type of guitar manufactured in Britain between 1932 and 1952, noted for its tinny sound quality. Django Reinhardt made this instrument famous. Tenor saxophone medium-sized member of the saxophone family played by such performers as Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young. Tinny, possessing a high-pitched metallic sound quality, Django Selmer guitar is representative of this sound. Significant people, Artie Shaw, clarinetist and band leader, Billie Holiday, vocalist, Billy Strayhorn, composer, arranger, pianist, Lester Young, tenor saxophonist, Ella Fitzgerald, vocalist, Jack Hilton, British band leader and booking agent, Coleman Hawkins, tenor saxophonist, Jimmy Blanton, bassist, Django Reinhardt, guitarist and composer. Irene and Vernon Castle, dance choreography team. James Reese Europe, band leader and arranger. Glenn Miller, band leader, arranger, trombonist. Stefan Grappelli, violinist. Ray Nance, violinist, trumpeter, Norman Grants, impresario, producer, social activist, Johnny Hodges, alto saxophonist, and Claude Debussy, composer. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.